So, uh, yeah, uh, I thought what would be a nice project to, to do for a Qt World Summit, and I was, okay, let's try to render the Earth. Uh, how hard can it be, right? Um, and also, that allowed me to, to test a few things with, uh, with Qt 3D at the same time. So, uh, we're going to, to discuss about two parts. Uh, the first one is a bit uh, of theory, but do we need to generate the Earth? And second part is the actual uh, implementation. Uh, and uh, always in practice, you've got things that do not work uh, the way they should, but that's, uh, that's the way it is usually. So uh, what do we need to uh, generate the Earth? Um, we need to generate the Earth ellipsoid. Uh, and an ellipsoid is, uh, you know, like a sphere that you would have left uh, on the floor and that would have been deformed slightly. So it's kind of a sphere, but with small deformations. But before we talk about that, we need to talk about coordinate systems. Usually on Earth, when you want to uh, describe the position of something, you're going to use uh, something called geographic coordinates, so that's latitude, longitude, and sometimes the altitude. Uh, latitude goes from uh, minus uh, 90 degree to 90 degree, and longitude from minus 180 degree to 180 degree. Unfortunately for us, GPUs expect coordinates to be in Cartesian space. So we need some kind of uh, transformation from geographic coordinates to Cartesian coordinates. And for that, we can use the uh, World Geodic System 84, which defines a coordinate system where uh, the Earth is centered in zero. The x-axis is the axis going from zero to uh, the geographic location, zero, zero. Uh, the y-axis is the axis going from uh, the Earth center to 90 degree of uh, longitude, zero de degree of latitude, and the z-axis is pointing up uh, towards the North Pole, so that could be any value of longitude and 90 degree of latitude. And there's one third uh, coordinate system we need to be aware of, uh, which is the projected coordinates. All the uh, layers, so if you think about Google Map, Bing map, OpenStreetMap are providing tiles which are in projected coordinates, so something that is 2D, and uh, we will have to deal with that uh, if we want to deal with uh, images on our Earth. So now let's really talk about the Earth ellipsoid. There are various techniques to create a sphere, and once we've got a sphere, we can convert that into an ellipsoid. So various techniques. Uh, there's no perfect technique, they all have advantages and disadvantages. The geographic grid uh, is usually the simplest approach that basically creates a sphere by using uh, disks or circles at a given uh, latitude and uh, longitude. Um, the nice thing with that is that you can my map quite easily imagery tiles to the geometry. The big downside is if you go near the poles, you've got lots of very small triangles, whereas if you go near the equator, you've got very large areas. So the tiles, geometric tiles, will be getting uh, uh, have a non-uniform size. Then there's cube map tessellation. Cube map tessellation is generating the Earth from a cube, or a sphere from a cube. It's better uh, when it comes to the area covered by our tiles. We've got more or less the same area, still not perfect. Uh, the big drawback is that it doesn't map straight away to imagery tiles. And finally, we've got something a bit more complex uh, called tetrahedron or octahedron tessellation, where uh, you do the same thing as with the cube, but using a tetrahedron. The nice thing with that is you can get a uniform geometric tile size for the whole Earth. Again, uh, that doesn't map straight to, with uh, imagery. Um, Keep in mind that we want to render the Earth, so we want to have lots of details in potentially every place. Um, but our GPU or our computer is not going to be able to render all of that, so uh, we're going to need a way to easily subdivide uh, our ellipsoid. And I chose, uh, not sure that was the perfect choice, but I chose to use uh, cube map tessellation. So we generate a cube, 
Um, and we can easily go from the cube to the sphere by normalizing each corner of our cube. By normalizing, we're making sure that all the corners are at the same distance from the center of our, uh, of our, of our cube, which gives us a sphere. The nice thing with a cube is that subdividing the faces of a cube uh, is pretty much the easiest thing you can do. You just uh, halve every, uh, every corner and you can easily subdivide a face into uh, quarters, which uh, we're going to, uh, to be seeing in the next, next few slides. So once you've got your sphere, and you've got for that to generate uh, a cube which goes from minus one to one on each axis, you can normalize the vertices. And if you want to transform that into an ellipsoid, you just have to multiply with the uh, WGS84 uh, RADI, uh, which defines that as to be uh, 6,378 kilometers on the equator. And uh, on the pulse, it's uh, slightly smaller. To, it's about 21 kilometers less. So that creates us that slightly deformed sphere. Um, nice thing with cube map is that in uh, OpenGL, we can create textures, six-faced textures, which are, sco are called cube map. So uh, in theory, uh, which should be, uh, it should be easy to map textures to our Earth uh, using that. Remember, we want to handle lots of details, so we need uh, a way to do that. And uh, we've got our cube, six faces, but if we assume that each, each of the face has a root node, we could use uh, an acceleration, acceleration structure called a quad tree, where for a given uh, node element, you can create four children. And each of these children have themselves four children until uh, you've reached the required level of detail. So that's one of the reasons why using a cube map uh, really becomes easy. Because what we want to do is, as we start rendering our Earth, we're going to want lots of subdivisions in the areas we are looking at. Um, so how does the subdivision algorithm work? Um, we start at the root node of each of our faces, and we, uh, we check if the node needs to be split. And we'll see the conditions for that in the next, uh, next slide. If the node needs to be split, well, we create four children, which are contained in uh, our tile. And for each of these four children, we, uh, we perform the same thing. We, we look, do we need to split or not? Okay. At one point, we will have reached uh, a case where a node doesn't need to be split. So you've got to check, does that node have any children? That might happen if you're reusing your nodes from the previous frame. If that's the case, you can destroy the children, which uh, I've called that uh, merge. And then the second thing is we need to check is our node visible by our camera. We only want to render nodes which are visible. We don't care about the ones which are on the other side of the Earth. And if that's the case, if it's visible, we add that to the list of nodes we need to, uh, to render. So when should the node be split? There are various ways of handling that case. Uh, I decided to use something, uh, a simplified model of the uh, chunked load algorithm, uh, which is basically you project your object uh, on the screen, so you get the size your object will do on the screen. If that satisfies a given uh, threshold, then you know that you do not need to split your node, otherwise you've got to split it. And in my case, I decided that if a given node on the screen took about 256 by 256 pixels, then I had reached the perfect uh, level of detail for that node. The other condition is that we only want to split something that we can actually see. And so when is a node visible? Well, usually it has to be a leaf node, which is not called by the camera, so that means that the node is within our field of view. It has to uh, not be too far from the camera, so I basically check the distance between a node and the camera, and if that falls within uh, a distance that is 
between us and the Earth Center, then I keep the node, otherwise I discard it, because that means the node is potentially on the back face uh, of the Earth. And finally, uh, there's another test, which is checking that uh, we are looking in the, well, when looking at in some direction, we want only to keep nodes which are facing us, okay? So I simply do a, a cross product between our view vector and the uh, normal of each node and check the value uh, for that. So I, I will quickly show you uh, what that kind of code could look like. So I've got something called uh, a cube. Right there, let's make it a bit bigger. So I've got something called a cube. Uh, the cube is composed of uh, six cube faces, and each cube face has a root node, uh, a quad, no quad node. Okay. And my quad node has uh, two important functions, split, which basically creates four children, and another method called merge, which destroys four children. Okay, so that I can apply the algorithm as described. Um, it contains two sets of uh, corners, the corners in cube coordinates and the corners in uh, spherical coordinates. Okay. Um, so that's for the quad node. Let's go back to the cube builder. So what the cube builder does is initially it initializes the root node on each of the cube faces, four corners for each. Then we've got that update function. That update function uh, performs in parallel the subdivision of each face. And for each face, I simply implemented the algorithm I, I've described previously. Should we split the node? If that's the case, we split it. We recurse for each of the children. Otherwise, we, we're dealing with a leaf node. Uh, and if that's not the case, we merge it and we add it to the list of renderables. And in practice, we get something like that. So we start obviously with a cube. We've got uh, no subdivisions yet. Well, only one root node. We can increase that. And you can see that as I, I start increasing, I get something that, uh, that looks a lot more like a sphere. Okay, or uh, a spheroid in my case. Um, the other nice thing is you'll see that if I increase the number of max subdivisions, you can uh, clearly see that there are areas where the cube, uh, well, the each faces are more subdivided than others. Those are because they didn't satisfy the threshold <laughs> level. And so as I move in closer, uh, I've got various levels of subdivisions occurring. Okay, and you can see on top the numbers of active tiles being used, so that increases uh, the close, closer I, I zoom in, but I still get around 500 tiles, which is a, a manageable rendering level uh, for us. Okay, so that's the part about creating uh, the Earth ellipsoid. Then comes the tricky part, uh, adding textures, images, uh, on our globe. Um, there are various providers of uh, images and pr they provide different types uh, of layers. You can have satellite images, or what I was interested in usually. You've got map layers, you've got uh, it layers if you want to see where uh, places on Earth are other than others. You've got uh, elevation layers, that kind of stuff. Oh, oh, do uh, image layers work? Usually they provide tiles, imagery tiles, which are projected in uh, web Mercator projection. And in web Mercator projection, well, it assumes that the Earth is a sphere. So uh, first mistake, uh, we made an ellipsoid. So that's actually more complex now to, uh, to handle textures. Uh, we will have to reproject, but we'll see that later. The really interesting part is how do we access uh, images? Uh, most of the providers are using something called sleepy map uh, addressing. 
So basically, the form that you, you usually find is the name of your provider slash a zoom level slash x slash y and dot uh, some extension, which in my case, for example, was dot png. Zoom level, usually they go between 0 and 18, and they basically define how many tiles cover the earth uh, for a given zoom level. So if you ask uh, for the zoom level 0, you've got one tile covering the whole uh, earth. If you use uh, the zoom level 1, you've got four tiles covering the earth. If you use uh, zoom level 2, you've got 16 tiles covering the earth. And if you zoom, uh, you use zoom uh, n, you've got two at the power of two times n tiles covering the world. So obviously, if you've got uh, the uh, zoom level 18, that starts to make quite uh, a few tiles, and uh, yeah, you're possibly not going to be able to run them, render them uh, all at once. Okay. So um, the other thing is that x and y. Uh, basically, they go between 0 and 2 at the power of zoom minus 1. 0 is in the top left corner. Uh, 2 at the power of uh, zoom minus 1 would be there uh, on both axes. And um, 0, 0, the tile 0, 0 with x, 0, 0 will map to, uh, well, its top left corner will map to the longitude of 85 degree dot something and uh, minus 100 uh, degrees of uh, longitude. You might wonder why minus 85 or 85 and not minus 90, like previously uh, said in the coordinate systems. Uh, the reason for that is because of the web Mercator projection. They're using a sphere instead of an ellipsoid, and somehow, for some reasons, which I haven't really dig deep into, uh, that ends up limiting the maximum latitude uh, you can use uh, for your image, image layers. So that means we'll have to work out something for the pulse. So now that we know how to request images, we've got uh, an issue that our geometric tile for a given node uh, in blue there could actually map out to multiple imagery tiles. So first, we're going to need to find which imagery tiles we need to render something. Then load them as textures and then work out texture mapping so that we can render them correctly. So how do we know uh, how many tiles do we need? Uh, first, you're going to convert, well, corners so that you can retrieve the minimum uh, longitude, minimum latitude, and the maximum longitude, maximum latitude. That gives you a bounding uh, rectangle. And you can then use that bounding rectangle to compute the number of tiles, imagery tiles you're going to need. And for that, you use a function which converts the longitude to a sleepy tile ID so that the x and the y for a given zoom level. Okay. That allows us to retrieve a minimum x, a minimum y, a maximum x, a maximum y, and with that, we got the number of tiles we need and their locations. Uh, in my code, I've purposely uh, limited the maximum number of imagery tiles for uh, a geometric tile to be four, because reasons. And then that's the part where uh, I still haven't been able to make it work uh, correctly. So take that, that slide with uh, a grain of salt. Uh, I may be saying something stupid, but my, my idea was, OK, we've got our image layers. We've got our geometric tile. What if we were to uh, find the top left corner of our geometric tile and compute an offset? use that, compute that offset for each of, of our imagery tiles, compute an extent, minimum extent, minimum uh, on both axes and maximum so that we know how wide uh, our imagery tiles are, and let do, let's do the, the mapping on the GPU. Okay. So uh, what I'm doing is computing a structure on the CPU side 
That structure contains the layer. Layer will be uh, the ID of our texture image. Scale will be the scale of our image. Offset will be the offset right there. And minimum and maximum extent will be stored uh, in the structure as well. I've got four possible imagery tiles, so um, I've got an array of four for both. Um, there are other tiles uh, that are not PNG or G JPEG, uh, which are called vector format tiles. Uh, those are tiles which are provided in JSON or in binary format, and they're actually really uh, interesting because they allow you to, uh, for example, say, okay, I want all the roads, uh, the road path for that area. And you get a, a JSON with uh, geographic coordinates for uh, a polygon which defines the roads. So you, you really get uh, a lot of precision and you get a lot less of uh, bandwidth used to request the data you want. The big drawback with uh, vector format tiles are that you need to assemble polygons. So that means on your CPU code, you probably are going to either implement a way to triangulate them or reuse something, but that's going to add a bit of uh, overhead. Uh, and when it comes to uh, rendering, you've got two things uh, you could do. You can uh, decide to uh, directly upload your triangles on the GPU, or you can decide to render your polygons into a texture and then reuse the work we've done previously with imagery layers to bind that on your, uh, on your globe. Um, option one is obviously um, interesting, but if you've got lots of polygons, that means you're going to probably do a lot of work every frame to re-render something that you could have rendered once into a texture. So that's, that's obviously something um, you should be paying attention to. And uh, one provider of tiles in vector format is uh, Mapzen, which we're going to talk about right now with terrain elevation. So um, Mapzen is a provider of uh, vector format tiles, elevation tiles. Uh, it's free, well, uh, until a given amount of bandwidth every month, but uh, until you reach that, uh, you should be fine. Uh, and they've got a really nice website, uh, re really well done. And they provide, in my case, elevation tiles. So elevation tiles are images, but in these images, for each pixel, they've encoded uh, a given uh, elevation. So the idea is that for each of our nodes, we've got a given number of vertices. We need to find the matching elevation image. And then on the GPU, in a shader, we should be able for each of our vertices, each vertex, we should be able to read into the texture the elevation and displace that vertex. Okay. So far, so good. Uh, quick uh, quick uh, talk about the various elevation formats available. Uh, you've got Terrarium, Normals, GeoTIFF, uh, SCADI. I chose to use terra Terrarium because uh, the explanations made sense and the way to retrieve uh, elevation was easy. Basically, they are provided as PNG tiles and uh, the, the altitude is encoded as 32,000 something offsets that they split into 24 bits. The red uh, component, you just have to multiply it by 266, add the blue component and uh, the green component, and then add the blue component divided by 256. All of that, uh, to all of that, you subtract the maximum number of offsets and you get your elevation in meters. And just for information, uh, all the values you will be getting will uh, always be within these two uh, values. Since on Earth, we can only go down as deep as minus 11,000 meters and up to uh, probably the height of uh, Mount Everest, so uh, close to uh, 9,000 meters. We've got one small problem. It's that for each node, we've been generating four corners. Okay? So if we've got four corners, and our image, we are obviously only going to be able to look up elevation for these four corners, but all that area we won't be able to cover. 
So um, we need to add more vertices per, uh, per node. So we could either decide on the CPU to subdivide some more our uh, cube face, or we can use something called tessellation shader on the GPU to uh, subdivide our quads into a given number of, uh, of subquads. Uh, the way it works is quite simple. You just specify how many subdivisions should be made on the outer edges and how many subdivisions should be made on the inner edges. And based on that value, you get uh, something a lot uh, more elevated. And if we've got uh, a finer grained grid, we should be able to have nicer elevation at render time. Okay. Um, so in practice, uh, how does that work? Uh, first, you've got to decide how you're going to do your drawing. Uh, do we need to have one draw call per geometric tile? Do we need to have one draw call per imagery tile? Uh, if we start having thousands of tiles, that's not going to be very efficient. Maybe we could try to draw everything with one draw call. Uh, so I decided I would try two options. One option was to draw everything with one draw call. The other was to first draw the cube, render each face of the cube into a texture with the proper uh, imagery layers applied, and then draw our, the sphere. And for each element of the sphere, look up the right uh, face in the cube and apply the texture there. So option, option two should be slightly more costlier than option one, but probably easier to implement. But the, the nice thing to remember is that both have a very low driver overhead because in the end we are only issuing one or two draw calls for possibly uh, hundreds of thousands of vertices and probably uh, half a thousand different tiles. Okay. Um, so I'll quickly uh, show you the code show you where I failed to, I, to have something that uh, works correctly, uh, which is when I apply uh, texture mappings. Uh, basically, I'm getting something that doesn't look at all like, like what, well, could argue that it's fine for North America, but if you try to find Europe or other places, you can see that some tiles are being repeat, repeated around. Uh, that's not working uh, at all the way I want it to. Uh, but anyway, the thing I, I really re re well, want to remember from that is that I'm still able to render, in that case, 300 tiles, each with up to four textures with a single draw call because of the way uh, I've been able to implement it with Qt3D. Uh, I now just need to work out uh, properly the texture mappings. Um, so in the code, maybe I've got something, yeah. How do I generate vertex data? What I do is use Qt3D render QBuffer Q attribute. I get a list of four corners, four corners per tile. Um, all of these corners, I add them into a buffer. Uh, I'll talk about a small trick about uh, floating point precision in a minute. But what I'm doing, building that buffer, for the texture, I use something called a texture array. A texture array allows you to have up, and up to uh, 2,000 something textures, well, texture images, which allow you to render with a single draw call that many textures. Otherwise, you can probably only render per draw call uh, eight or 16 textures at once. Okay? So using that trick, these two tricks, technically allows me to use only a single draw call. And how do I store the mapping between a geometric tile and its textures? I use something called a uniform buffer object, which basically stores the structure I showed you earlier, well, an array of structure where I have the offsets, the layers, um, the extent, and so on. Okay. Um, and that we can look, well, I'll continue a bit and then show you the code. Obviously, uh, there's one big problem when you're doing that all on the GPU is that GPUs work fine with uh, single float precision. Uh, some GPU handle doubles, but as soon as you start doing doubles, um, CPU are a lot less efficient and you're, you're limiting your, uh, your reach 
as uh, not all GPUs are able to do that. Uh, there are two types of issues that are going to happen is that we're modeling things which are possibly hundreds or thousands of kilometers away down to uh, meters units. So um, when we're going to compute position of our vertices, it could be that by converting to floats, we're going to lose some precision. That precision could be um, hundreds of meters once we are done to uh, the Earth's surface. And so as we're going to, uh, to be moving around the camera of our renderer, we're going to see things move around because the hardware isn't able to figure out which one is closer, which one is farther away. So we've got that issues for both vertices and for depth. So how can we work around that? Uh, we can use something called rendering relative to the eye. So that means that on the uh, CPU side, we compute everything in doubles. That's fine. But we, we do one trick, which is to retrieve the eye position. And what we send to the graphic card is a vertex relative to the eye. So that's the vertex minus the eye position. And what we get there, we can easily convert to a float without losing uh, precision. And at render time in our shaders, what we do is we retrieve the view matrix, but we convert that view matrix into a view matrix which has no translation for the eye element. And if we do that, if you use that matrix, we can basically use things the way uh, we usually do in OpenGL and uh, write something such as uh, gel position equals projection matrix times view ma matrix RTE times our position in our RTE coordinates. Pretty easy to do, uh, actually. How do we work around depth precision? Uh, depth is stored as 1 over z. So um, if you plot that, you can see that uh, as we are getting uh, further away, we've got a lot less precision for two values which would be far away. Okay? For values where we're, which are quite near the camera, that's, that's fine. But as we, we, we're going to look at things which are possibly hundreds of kilometers away, a small precision issue there could cause one area to be rendered before the other when uh, that's not the case. So you've got various ways around that. The one I chose, which seemed to be working, is adjusting the near plane and far plane depending on my zoom level. Depending on how close to the Earth I am, I'm going to uh, you know, only say that I want to look from that area up to that area, and that really uh, restricts uh, values I can have on that curve, and that works, uh, that works fine for, for my use case. There are other techniques, such as using a logarithmic depth buffer, which basically changes the distribution of, of values on that curve which could have also been used. Uh, I think I've also implemented it, but in practice, that's, that's not needed for, for what I'm doing. Um, and let's look now at the actual rendering code. So remember, I'm splitting every face um, somewhere right there. Once I've, I'm done splitting every face, I'm building an array of vertices, and I've got something called uh, a cube sphere. And my cube sphere is a cute 3D entity which has various properties and which is going to provide a sphere renderer. Uh, basically, that's the object to use to render the Earth. And to create data for that sphere renderer, I've got a method called update cube. Update cube checks if we really need to update something. If that's the case, we call our cube builder update. Then I create a buffer for all my uh, image mappings for each layer. Upload that. Do the same thing. But the, the part which is really interesting for you is uh, that one. I'm retrieving the vertices in uh, Cartesian space. I'm retrieving the eye position of my camera. And what I'm doing is for each of my vertex, I'm subtracting the eye position. Okay. Subtracting the eye position, converting that to a float, and, uh, 
and appending that to a buffer. Once I'm done filling my buffer, I just set the data on my Q2D Q buffer, and I'm going to be able to render. Um, so that cube sphere is actually created from QML right there. So I specified camera, uh, viewport size, wherever I want to use imagery or elevation. And I created an entity. That entity has a material. So basically, all the shaders needed to render my sphere, transformation, which is not needed. And that entity references my sphere renderer. Uh, we can have a brief look at the shaders, the ones, ones which are going to be interesting are subdivide tessellation, so that is executed for every uh, node, and I'm saying for every node that I want to subdivide the outer edges by tile subdivision and the inner edges by tile subdivision as well. So that means I'm subdivide, subdividing uh, each, co well, each side of my, uh, my quad by eight, uh, in that case, could increase that to uh, 16 if my GPU were powerful, en powerful enough, sorry. And then for each hour point of our vertex we need to render, I compute the view matrix RTE, perform the elevation displacement if I want to, and what I write is just what I showed you our GL position is our projection matrix times the view matrix RT times our position plus possibly our displacement vector. Okay. So we got that, and once we go to the fragment shader, so that's for each pixel, we're going to execute that. For each pixel, I'm going to look, I'm sending in an index, that index I use to look into a buffer of texture info, and that buffer contains structs, which I've described to you a bit earlier, which I use for texture mapping. And so what I'm doing, if I'm using imagery, is that since I can have up to four, four different images per geometric tile, I'm iterating over them, retrieving the layer, which is basically my index into my array of texture, computing the scale, the offset, and, and that's where there's probably something wrong with my formula. Um, I should have something that maps out correctly uh, the earth tiles, which is, is not the case at the moment, but technically something that shouldn't be too hard to, uh, to handle. So rest of the code, basically everything fits into the main, so I've got my main item, cute quick, my scene 3D element to render 3D content, my uh, frame graph, which is a very basic frame graph. I've got a main viewport, I clear the buffer, and I render uh, my scene. And the other one is for a small, uh, so that we can see the small axes on the side. That's not technically necessary. And that's, uh, that's about as far as it goes for the QML part uh, of the, the 3D rendering, and that part is just the cute quick UI so that can, I can show the altitudes on top, the sliders at the bottom, but that's, uh, that's, very, that's it. Um, so where was I? Yeah. Oh, did I implement the camera zoom? Uh, pretty easy, I created a sequence. Every time you're increasing your value into the sequence, you're moving the camera um, by half the value, half its distance, so as you move closer, you're always moving uh, a bit closer half the distance at every step. Um, and the code for that should be available uh, on that GitHub address, uh, maybe not right now, but at least tomorrow. And there's actually not that much uh, amount of C++ nor QML code, about 2,000 lines in total, and uh, you know, and if you want to, to use that, you've got, uh, I've provided scripts scripts so that you can download uh, satellite uh, images and elevation images. You just need to create a free Mapzen account to do that and, um, and use the script and specify the zoom level you want and it will download the, the tiles for you if you want to, uh, to try out the, the code. Um, and I think, yeah. 
possible improvements, obviously, uh, I'd like to get uh, texture mapping to work correctly. And then there are other things we could do uh, using a dedicated Q3 aspect, um, perform smart tessellation. Right now, I'm subdividing everything by uh, eight all the time. It might make sense to only subdivide, you know, uh, more things which are closer to the camera and less things, things which are further away. Um, cracks, could show you cracks. Um, because of the way that works, let's say, uh, just need to find example of cracks. Uh, yeah. Right there, you can see a bit of white. So that's what is called cracks. There are techniques uh, to handle that. So I'd like to handle that correctly as well. Uh, but really, my, my, my big disappointment is, is not having been able to work out correctly the texture mappings. So I know I'm getting a different texture for each, um, each node, but uh, well, four different textures. Uh, but not, that's not working correctly. So hopefully for next year that will be uh, that will be done. And um, you can see that for each each node, I'm actually uh, showing the wireframe. So uh, when I was talking about the four corners, all the subdivisions are the small rectangles you can see uh, within. Okay, and you can uh, you can disable that and just have uh, a colored rendering uh, for each different tile. And I think we're close to uh, to the end of that. Well, yeah, let's not forget that. Uh, if you're interested by the subject, there are a few a few books, a few presentation you can uh, look into. Uh, 3D engine design uh, for vir virtual globes uh, is really nice. That was made by the guys which are doing the cesium WebGL renderer. Uh, the second one is a talk by one of the author of the book as well, which is uh, really interesting. Then you've got uh, rendering massive terrains, uh, chunk level of detail. That's uh, by the guy who uh, invented that algorithm. So uh, you've got his SIGGRAPH presentation URL underneath. And you've got uh, an article by uh, someone from NVIDIA about depth precision, ways to work around it, which is uh, quite interesting if uh, if you, if you like that, that kind of literature. And that's it for me, end of your suffering, and um, I hope uh, you learned something. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, if you've got questions, uh, feel free. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, very interesting. I have two questions. The first is, uh, possible uh, improvements. Does that mean you are going to improve it, continue working on it? Or? Um, that was just an example I made uh, for the talk. Maybe I'll continue uh, if I've got the motivation in the weekends. Uh, but otherwise, that, that's really going to depend on, you know, if I've got nothing to do on a, sun, uh, a rainy Sunday uh, evening or if I find other more interesting subjects in the meantime. Thanks. But, the yeah. second question is uh, about the texture mapping of the um, tiles. Yeah. Uh, so you show that uh, you may need up to four, t four, four textures to, to map one yeah. tile. I was wondering, um, couldn't you use the tessellation shaders to cut the tile and then use only one texture per each piece? Um. I would love to look at the diagram again. Maybe, uh, maybe that's totally possible, but uh, what I think my case is, is that sometimes, because I'm using uh, a quad sphere and not uh, a geographic grid, I end up with tiles which lie over four imagery tiles or more. So uh, what I could do in the, the tessellation shaders or my uh, fragment shaders is try to find what's the start of that imagery tile render it for that part, and then move on to the other one, which is what I tried to do, but somehow failed. So yeah, maybe uh, I just you know rushed that a bit over the weekend, didn't work uh, the way I thought it would. So 
Yeah, let's, let's see if next year I'm able to make it work and do another presentation about proper texture mapping uh, on an Earth ellipsoid. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I want to ask a question about the uh, uh, projection error you mentioned before from Mercator map to... Yeah. Can, you, can we go back to that slide, please? So that's that one, I think, right? Uh, before that? The one before? Or was it the, one of the very first you wanted, that one? No, later. I, I think that was the one where I mentioned the minus 85 or instead of 90 degrees. Was that the uh, one? No, no, not this one. It's uh, about you are using the tiles, but they are so that one created with respect to a sphere, but you are using an ellipsoid. So you yeah. said later cross. Uh, yeah, so, so that's that part, uh, I think. Uh, the thing is, um, I'm, I'm getting things. Uh, yes, this one. I, so. I'm getting uh, images which have been made for a sphere. Mm -hmm. But I'm not rendering a sphere anymore. I'm rendering an ellipsoid. So I might have, especially uh, if you think about North America, in these areas, I, I will have uh, tiles which are slightly stretched upward. And so uh, that's not going to look correct. Uh, the size is going to be wrong. So you need to do something which is called merc Mercator uh, reprojection to uh, compensate for that offset. Uh, and that part I haven't looked into. I know it's an issue I've got right now, but yeah, that would also need to, to be done uh, if I wanted to, to complete that. Is there any uh, source on that or you, are, you will just make something custom? Uh, for that, I think uh, I read something uh, in the second second link. They mentioned that very specific issue about web mercator reprojection. I so uh, yeah, that talk is really uh, the only source of documentation I found which some somewhat addressed my issues. Okay. Um, so yeah, I really recommend having a look uh, at that one. Thanks. Anybody else? Any questions? Then let's go so, to the break. I think all I can say then is thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you.